Hi, and thank you for watching. Many watchmen are now looking to Purim as the next high watch date for the possible return of our Heavenly Bridegroom. But are they perhaps overlooking something? In this video we will look at some of the hidden treasures in God's Word that point us to a possible earlier date before Purim arrives, and that date is almost upon us. In the previous video we looked at the amazing design of the heavens above us. We now know that all eclipses that ever occurred and that will ever occur are mirrored around January 11th, 2024. So obviously this has to be a very important date from the perspective of the creator of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who designed the heavens and the signs that are given to us here on earth with a specific purpose in mind to be mirrored around January 11th, 2024. We have also seen how the iPetco 2 animation includes hints to this aspect of the heavens and how this is connected to the removal of God's church from the earth, allowing the Antichrist to operate on the earth without restraint. The eclipses that are mirrored around January 11th also remind us of the menorah that is described in God's word. And it is very interesting to see what else God's word has to say about this object that is also positioned in the holy place of the temple. The menorah is a golden lampstand with seven candles made out of pure gold and described to us in Exodus 25. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made, his shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops and his flowers shall be the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds, with a knop and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick... And in the candlestick shall be four bowls, made like unto almonds, with their knops and their flowers. And there shall be a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knops and their branches shall be of the same. All it shall be one beaten work of pure gold." And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. What is really interesting about this passage is to see how the almond tree is incorporated into the design of the menorah. And one then logically has to ask, why would God want the menorah to be associated with the almond tree, its blossoms and its fruit, and not the myrtle tree, for instance? It is very interesting to discover that the first five books in the Bible also have hidden in them attributes that one could compare with that of the menorah and the mirrored eclipses that we saw on January 11th. In the next clip that I share from one of my all-time favorite Bible teachers, Chuck Missler, he demonstrates the menorah concept as it is embedded in the first five books of the Bible, also known as the Torah. People ask me frequently, are there hidden codes in the Bible? And uh, there absolutely are. There's so much nonsense and so much contrived uh, foolishness around that many people get uh, disenchanted with the idea of hidden messages in the scripture, but they are there, and I want to show you a few. Proverbs 25 2 tells you that. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's the honor or duty of kings to search out the matter. Way back in the 16th century, Rabbi Cordovero pointed out that the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of letters. So this idea of Bible codes is not a new idea, it's a rediscovery of things that were known centuries ago. There are dozens of different kinds of encryptions in the scripture, and I'm not going to go through all those here, relax. But there's one particular kind that is called an equidistant letter sequence. And it's the one that's being very much abused by, by promoters and things, but nevertheless there are some that are real. The equidistant letter sequence. Here's an this is a contrived example to give you an idea what they are. On the screen, there's a sentence. Rips explained that each code is a case of adding every fourth letter to form a word. That's just a, an arbitrary sentence I put on the screen. But it turns out that if you take every fourth letter of that, that's an equidistant letter sequence of the spacing of uh, three between each letter, you then discover that every fourth letter forms another message. In this case, it's, it says, read the code. 
This is just a demonstration to give you a feeling for what we mean by an equidistant letter sequence. This technique was known to the ancient rabbis. This is one of many. When those uh, rabbinical experts rose to power in the courts of Europe during the Renaissance period, they were the experts that contrived the cryptography available to the various kings. So if you study the history of secret writing or cryptography, you'll discover it really has its roots in the, among ancient rabbis in ancient Israel, and it's traceable through the courts of Europe as they invent better and more sophisticated codes, leaning on their, their, their insights. And it, because the codes got so sophisticated in World War II, the, uh, uh, we developed computers to break the codes. That's what Turing uh, in, in uh, 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 John von uh, Neumann in the United States and Alan Turing in Britain were the two experts that really gave us the modern computer. But his original mission was to, br to break the Nazi codes, which it did. But it's interesting that those same computers have now allowed us to rediscover the very things that the rabbis knew thousands of years ago. And so it's a very fascinating study. So, right, but let me just give you one example to give you a flavor of this. This is uh, Genesis chapter 1 in Hebrew. Now, I want to remind you that Hebrew goes from right to left. Also, the word Torah in Hebrew is spelled with four letters. A ta, which is roughly equivalent to our T, an O, a resh, a he, um, four letters. If you go to the first how in the book of Genesis, and uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet that happens, and you count 49 letters, you come to a vav, you count 49 more letters, and you come to a resh, which is sort of like our R, and you count 49 more letters, you come to a he. So that is four, those four letters spelled Torah. Now I need to remind you that all languages flow towards Jerusalem. Did you know that? All nations east of Jerusalem go from right to left. All nations west of Jerusalem go from left to right. All languages flow towards Jerusalem. I don't know what you're going to do with that piece of information, <laughs> but I think it's interesting. Now, you can follow this without knowing Hebrew, probably, but you say, now, why 49? Was a square of seven? Okay, that's fine. That's not, that, not too surprising, but just a coincidence, of course, or is it? Now, you could argue, well, that's just an accident of the frequency of letters and so forth. It's kind of rare, but interesting, except what happens is when you go to the book of Exodus, you go to the first how. Count 49 letters, you get a vav. 49 letters, you get a resh. 49 letters, and you get a hey. Same thing happens. What's the probability of that? Whatever the first probability is, it's that squared. <laughs> okay? So it's very unlikely. Genesis, Exodus, you go to Leviticus, and it doesn't happen. And when it doesn't, you just almost feel a sigh of relief. Huh? But when you go to Numbers... The same thing happens it backwards. You take the first hey, the first resh, the first vav, the first tau, you get Torah spelled backwards. Now that's weird. What's weird, if nothing else, I don't know how they found this out. They must have had time on their hands. You know. <laughs> they didn't have computers. You know, this was you go to Deuteronomy, you have essentially the same equivalent thing happens. And now you're puzzled because you've got it forward, forward, backward, backward can't resist going back to Leviticus and looking at Leviticus more closely. We have 49 and 7 squared letter sequences. Torah, Torah, forward in Genesis, Exodus, uh, backwards in Numbers and Deuteronomy. Well, if you look at Leviticus, you discover that every seventh letter spells the unpronounceable name of God. Often rendered Jehovah or Yahweh. Trans, uh, re, re uh, uh, expressed as Adonai among the Hebrews. They won't pronounce that name. They'll use Lord, the word Lord instead. Well, now we stand back from all of this. We have the, the name of God, and we suddenly realize that the Torah always points to the name of Jehovah. Now, what's the chance of that happening by accident? And by the way, if you've tried to contrive something like this and still maintain logic in the text, that's a challenge. This is a very non-trivial thing to design if you set out to design it that way. So uh, many of us tend to regard these kinds of things in general as fingerprints of the Holy Spirit. 
Then when we read Revelation 1, John gives a very interesting description of Jesus, who is once again associated with the menorah, and standing right in the middle of it. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth, and was dead. And behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. In this passage, Jesus is once again shown in the middle of the candlestick, and having the menorah featured starting with the first five books of the Bible, all the way to the very last book in God's word. This would certainly confirm Jesus' declaration to John that he is the first and the last. Additionally, having recently discovered that even the heavens above us were designed according to this model, gives a whole new understanding to the following passage. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. There is definitely a line in time that divides future and past eclipses so that they are mirrored around this line. And is it not interesting that in both the embedded code of the Torah and in Revelation's description of Jesus, that line represents him. In Psalm 19 we also see the reference to the bridegroom that comes out of his chamber being associated with this description. If we wondered about the proper meaning of the menorah, the last verse in this passage from Revelation clearly tells us that the menorah represents the seven churches that are then featured in the following two chapters of Revelation. Now in Matthew 24 we read the following. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This is really a very interesting passage that most Christians would position after the Great Tribulation. 
However, God's word clearly says, and I have also covered this in previous videos, that judgment begins at the house of God. And therefore it is the church that will first experience tribulation in this world, as our Heavenly Father tests those who believe in Jesus Christ as being the Son of God. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? But notice what Elsa shared with us in Matthew 24. Jesus says that after the testing of his church, the end of this period would be marked with a solar and lunar eclipse, followed by the stars that will fall from heaven and the shaking of the powers of the heavens. And then he points us to the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the heavens. What could this sign be? Given that Jesus presents himself to John in Revelation 1 as the center of the menorah, it is certainly possible that the heavenly menorah that we saw on January 11th could be the heavenly sign that Jesus referred to. The other would be a collision between Jupiter and an obscure celestial object that the Bible refers to as the Red Dragon, that will pull a third of the stars with his tail and cast them to the earth after the prophesied interaction that we read about in Genesis 3.15 has taken place. This would also be linked to the stone that is cut without hands from a mountain that is referred to in Daniel chapter 2, that will hit the statue representing the ruling kingdoms of the earth on its feet. Thou sawest, till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. What comes next in Matthew 24 is very important because the sign of the coming of the Lord comes before the tribes of the earth mourn and when Jesus returns on the clouds to collect those that belong to him. Knowing that the heavenly menorah could be in play in this passage, being linked to the sign of the Son of Man being displayed to us in the heavens, we find a similar description to what Jesus gave in Matthew 24 in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Please consider what Solomon shared in the following passage. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun, or the light, or the moon, or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened. And the doors shall be shut in the streets, when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and a desire shall fail. Because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. This passage features several aspects that Jesus mentioned in Matthew 24. Solomon refers here to the darkening of the sun, moon, and stars, and a time that would seem to represent a lockdown, where people would be in their homes, shops would be closed, food would be scarce, and where life in general would seem to be without joy, and where people will live in fear. Solomon also refers to the mourners that Jesus pointed out in Matthew 24. But in Ecclesiastes, Solomon drops a very important hint in this passage, telling us that all of these events are associated with people going to their eternal homes, and where mourners will then be seen in the streets. Jesus also refers to this in several parables as the time of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Solomon also indicates that these events are associated with the blooming of the almond tree, and I believe this is where the Holy Spirit inspired Solomon to draw a connection between the almond tree in bloom, which points to a very specific time of the year, 
and the menorah which incorporates this tree into its design, and representing God's church on the earth. Now the almond tree has a relatively short blooming period, and it is the first of the trees to begin to bloom while it is still winter. In Israel, almond trees blossom from January to February, giving us a very specific window of time to associate with Solomon's explanation in Ecclesiastes 12. And this would mean that Purim, which occurs in March, may fall just outside of that window. Remember, my understanding could be wrong, and it may very well be Purim that we need to keep our eyes on. But the connection between the menorah, the church, and the time in which almond trees blossom would seem to be a major message to the church regarding a specific time of the year. In Amos 8, we have another passage that provides even more detail to what is shared in Matthew 24 and Ecclesiastes 12. And in this passage, this bitter day on which people begin to mourn is discussed. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn? And the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit? that we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day, and I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head and I will make it as the morning of an only sun, and the end thereof is a bitter day. These two passages from Amos 8 point to a time when the coming rulers of the world will trade people as if they are food. But this should be no surprise, as 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9 tells us that we are God's harvest and His temple. And in Revelation 6 we have a confirmation of this understanding where we are told the price of a measure of barley and a measure of wheat, where barley represents people with faith in Jesus as being the Son of God, and where the wheat represents Israel. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The same understanding was shown to us on the cover of the Economist magazine for the world in 2019, where people are weighed in balances, just as described in this passage from Revelation, and confirming what Jesus said when he spoke of the time of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Also, in Amos 8, notice how those who are waiting their time to rule are waiting for the new moon to be gone. And when would that be? The new moon would certainly be gone when a full moon is visible in the sky. It just so happens that the date around which all eclipses past and future are mirrored was marked by a new moon, and that brings us then to the full moon of January 25th, which also happens to fall on a feast day that does not appear in God's word. The new year for trees, also known as Tuba Shavat, was first instituted around 200 AD and serves as Israel's Arbor Day, where they celebrate nature and this almost makes one think of a statement by King Charles at COP28 last year, where he positioned nature above that of humanity in God's creation. And we need to remember too that the indigenous world view teaches us, teaches us that we are all connected not only as human beings, but with all living things and all that sustains life. As part of this grand and sacred system, harmony with nature must be maintained. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus says that the Son of Man is as a man who has taken a far journey who left his house and gave authority to those who serve him. This would point to the passage from Proverbs 7, where this imagery was first used, and where we are told that the good man of the house returns when the moon is full. Now if Jesus was pointing his disciples to Tuba Shavat, they truly would not have known the day, since this holiday in Israel had not been instituted at the time when Jesus spoke to them about this. 
In this passage he told them twice to watch, which in Hebrew would be the same word as almond. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house, and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, Watch. For the good man is not at home, he is gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. Tuba Shavat is only hours away at the time of this video's publishing, and given all the connections to this time of the year that we are seeing in God's word, there is a great possibility that the good man could return on the next full moon. If not, then we keep watching as our Heavenly Father provides us with more clues to the timing of our Bridegroom's return. I hope this blesses you and that you will be found ready and watching when the Bridegroom arrives. Until next time, or until we meet in the air, God bless.